All right, guys. Good morning and gals. Good morning and welcome to another episode of Road FS Detail Memoirs, where we meet with the movers and shakers, the detailers, the vendors, the suppliers, and the story's all about you. So my name's Jody and... I'm Rod Pusey, and RotaFest Detail Memoirs is obviously sponsored by RotaFest, the software that drives your business. Please go to our YouTube channel and subscribe to it so you can see all these awesome videos. I think we're over 75 now, maybe, um, from the past years, and there's some fabulous content on there, just like we're going to have today with Bob. Well, we are super excited. So Bob Rassman and I, and Rod, I think we've always been kind of interacting at mobile tech expo or some other event and so finally we've been able to wrestle him down to get him <laughs> to fest detail memoirs well good morning to you good morning rob good morning jody man we're, yeah. we're super so how it looks like you're hunkered down like me in a basement so you must yeah. be sequestered from the corona <laughs> Yeah, I'm in a bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's easy to do. So, no, it's, we're super excited. So, so let's jump right into this. You are the international trainer for Carbright, but how did you get started in the detailing industry? Well, you know, I'll give you a quick background, guys. I, I grew up on a farm in, in north, uh, northwest Ohio, and... Growing up on a farm, I had a lot of advantages because my dad always did his own stuff. He fixed things like he would fix a plow, he would fix a, a tractor, we fixed gar we, we, we had motorcycles, go-karts and all that kind of stuff. So I always had my hands involved in something mechanical or working on painting something. So basically we made our we even made our own hopper wagons. I don't know if you know what a hopper wagon is for the grains. Dad bent the sheet metal, we welded it all up. And I've never heard anybody else do that. So we, we didn't farm anything out. We basically did a lot of our stuff ourselves. And I'm really glad that we did that because I've learned more things about. And as a trainer, you know, I, I can talk to people about a lot of different subjects. Um, but the getting what I did was I was working in a, uh, a body shop and, uh, and also going to school at the same time. So I was going to school at an Apollo uh, Joint Vocational School, I enrolled. I enrolled like in the in in this class uh, my junior year, and I did my junior and senior year, and I worked in a custom body shop um, after school, and it was really cool because I had the education, and then I also had the uh, the experience of working in a custom shop, and we did really cool things there. Like we had a seventy uh, Ford pickup truck, and we put a uh, a 57 uh, front end on it from a 57 Galaxy, mm. and we go, we go, we go wing the doors on it, and then we put flares on it, and, we, and I learned how to do the sheet metal and stuff like that. So, but what I found was what I really enjoyed doing, working on my own cars and buying cars and fixing them, is the painting and doing the body work. So, um, I come to my, my training with like a body shop background. Mm. <clears throat> awesome. That sounds like a lot of fun. Sounds like one of the projects. Yeah, I've done some weird projects as well. We did we did a, a Mazda RX3 station wagon with a 289 in it, welded the rear door shut and turned the exhaust around and run it straight out where the headlights are supposed to be. And that was our high school drag car. Nice, awesome, awesome. <laughs> hey, you, you, you and me got a lot in common there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we could just turn the in, turn the show into you guys geeking about cool projects you've done in the past. It'd be pretty fun. So, I noticed that you've you're carrying that legacy of father teaching son because I think your most recent post you had your son out there changing the brakes and other stuff on the car. So yeah, my, my son does uh, uh, World War II reenactments and he wants to do a Vietnam reenactments and. I bought him a uh, 1948 Jeep Willys, and nice. uh, we're working on it. But I'm doing most of the work, it seems like. <laughs> but I'm making, I'm dragging him into it too, so he can learn. But uh, and it's good that I've got some projects like that to do during this downtime. So that that's awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, you know, you are the international trainer for Carbright, and given Corona. 
and COVID affecting everybody's ability to get in person and get training, what kind of adaptations, if any of you guys made to help continue that training? Well, we basically, you know, the first three weeks of, of, of this shutdown, I, I got on the phone and called like every person from, you know, Canada to Mexico, from California to, to Miami and to Maine. And I, just, I just called them to see how they were doing because I got tired of hearing the media. I wanted to talk to the real people that I've grown to love and train and, and get to know their families. And uh, it was pretty, pretty awesome. And I've seen so many different things. Uh, you know, some families have two incomes coming in. Some, some have they've lost two incomes. And some are some have uh, respiratory problems with their wife. So you find out a lot of things about people that you've done training for. Uh, and I've learned a lot of things from them and uh, the human side of it. it it's, it's actually been pretty good. So uh, but as far as uh, I've been on the phone a lot, uh, I've been I've been I've been down too. I've been a little bit down and depressed a little bit. But you know what? I'm keeping myself, you know, motivated with projects and doing things and and I'm calling, calling, and I want to be doing more of this eventually in the future. And also some, you know, 30 second training videos so we can uh, ramp it up in case this right. happens again. So yeah, and that, and that's awesome. It's it's funny. Um, I started uh, last oh October, August or September. Um, there's a young man here in town. His his dad's a, a lifetime friend of mine, and he wants to do paint and body work, and he wanted to learn how to do it. And so he actually got it approved with his school that he could do a um, <clears throat> kind of an internship for school yeah. credit through his high school last fall. And then he had so much fun doing it that uh, in January, he asked if he could do it again. And so we started his second kind of uh, internship um, <clears throat> program for his high school for his, for credit. And with why don't you say what it really is? Rod slave. He's a minion. <laughs> well, he's a great kid. And, and it was, was really uh, <laughs> kind of disappointed because when this all happened, I was like, how are we going to continue this training? So what we did is he actually, um, he started uh, taking the stuff that he'd learned in the first semester and he's and he, in his garage at home, he stripped apart his dirt bike and he would call me on the phone and we continued doing stuff. And we actually finished his intern. I just signed off on it just the other day and sent the papers in. Um, but he was actually able to finish it over the phone and, and through like, you know, what we're doing <clears throat> to where he finished restoring kind of a dirt bike instead of working on the project we were working on. Yeah, I, I tell you what, I, I love the aspect of the, knowing the paints. Uh, I, did, I do a lot of PowerPoints and I did one down at Mobile Tech a few years ago on the history of paints and how Henry Ford, how he, he was trying to get all these cars out. He had to get them out quick. So they, they stole a process from Japan called Japaning, which what basically was is baking. They were baking on the paint, uh, getting it real hot. It was like, like a cookie coming out of the oven. And as soon as it cooled, it was, it was hard. And they could, get it, they could get it out of the manufacturers and get it to the people. So he couldn't, he couldn't sit around and wait for the paint to dry. <laughs> so mm. learning these paints, these glycinite paints and the uh, nitrocellulose paints and all the alkalite paints and, and, and doing a seminar on basically how to, how to train and identify paints if you're doing a museum collection or or a huge private collection and the paint the paint knowing the paint you know what what a solvent pop is and i know what a solvent pop is i used to put them in there and I, <laughs> but you, you find it with the fish eyes not wiping it down and having to put fish eye eliminator in do the things that you you you, you learn and then from the training side it gives you a little bit better aspect of what, and I'm sure uh, Rob knows what I'm talking about. You, you understand the paints a little bit better, the densities, how hard they are, how soft they are, and yep. why they make a production paint, why they make a harder paint. And, uh, right. and, and what the temperature just, and everything does to it. I've got a, um, we do a lot of stuff with, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the um, production painting areas. Like we, I, there's a big dealership we go to, a uh, mega dealership in Texas. And they put about 150 cars through a day. And when they're doing um, bumpers and mirrors, trunks and hoods is all they paint. They won't do a whole car. Um, <clears throat> they don't even know mixing ratios. I asked one of the guys there, when, when one of the painters, and I said, okay, so what do you do as far as mixing? He goes, oh, I don't have to do anything. I just put the pot. There's a, 
disposable pot that goes into a machine and I punch in what the car is and it just spits out the paint and I put it on and spray it. They don't even, they don't even understand, <clears throat> you know, hey, if it's a little bit hotter, I have to use this type of reducer and I've got to make sure that, <clears throat> that I get it on there, the drying times, the flash times are gonna be different. If it's, you know, high humidity, low humidity, they, they just grab the thing out of the machine and put it on the car. And I was blown away by that because I thought that's that's kind of an art that's lost in the yes. industry because um, not that it's fun. I mean, when you screw up a paint job, it's not fun, but no. you learn, you learn really fast. You're like, ah, it was a little too high a humidity there. And it went on and now it looks like a giant orange. How do I fix that? So, um, you know, or it's running too much. And that was one of the things that with this intern, uh, I did, um, we're doing just a, I call it the tray low trash. I took a 1955 Chevy pickup bed and I just had him DA it, sand it all down, left all this 27 colors of paint, bare metal and everything. And then I just had him shoot, uh, one coat of paint it's matching a 55 pickup that i'm building um, one coat of paint on the inside of the bed a different color on the outside and then we sanded that back down through so all the crap came through and it just looks all patinaed out and then we put three coats of clear on it and from the time he sprayed the first coat of paint to the time he sprayed the last coat of clear there was a different understanding of how fast he had to move what the mixing ratios were why you don't just go on and just you know go all different directions what happens now that you made that run happen how do we fix that um, you know things like that and that's i think that's an important part of that learning whenever you're teaching anybody is sometimes you learn through making a mistake and um <clears throat> jody and i met a guy in las vegas last year that wanted to learn how to polish cars the young kid he had a polisher and he says i've never taken it out of the box I, i'm scared to use it and i said oh dude Go to a junkyard and buy a hood, buy a trunk, take it home yeah. and, and see how hard you can push before you burn through. Teach yes. yourself by making having a big mistake and then you go, oh, I really had to push and I had to get it really super hot before I actually burned through that paint. So I think that's the best teacher sometimes is just doing it. Yeah, I, you, like you said, the, you know, the, when I was doing it, the guys were doing, we were, they were doing the leading. We'd let the seams on the, on the, on the yeah, pillars for the, where we hook up the uh, the roof to the quarter panels and we yeah. let those in. That, that goes way back. And uh, a lot of people don't even know about that. They're using Duraglass or something like that. But I go back to the school, I'm on the advisory board. So I go back and talk to the students and the kids about, and they, they've got, they've got a, a simulator there that you, you hold the gun and you're looking at the screen and it shows you how your patterns are and how you're going to overlap and whether you need to narrow your fan pattern in, bring it back and stuff. And I'm like, we didn't have any of that kind of stuff when I went there. No. Years ago. <laughs> yeah. My, mine is, mine is a piece of cardboard. So you take water, <laughs> put it in the paint gun, put water in the paint gun, hold up a piece of cardboard and you can see exactly what you're doing. Yes. Me too. Me too. But, uh, awesome. So as part of your training, um, you know, obviously with your paint background, what are the kind of the tips that you're giving newer detailers to really help them understand, you know, what paint they're working with? Because I think a lot of them, they're just like, oh, you know what, let's go work on that Toyota and I'm going to use the same style that I normally do or same techniques as, as I did on, you know, the, you know, the Dodge Ram that I was just working on. How are you teaching them that finesse? You know, that, that's a good question because it's like uh, how many licks to get to the middle of a Tootsie Pop uh, because it's, <laughs> everybody wants to know what kind, type how, what type of cars have what paints. And what we find is that there's tendencies uh, with manufacturers. And we know that you know, GM uh, 2015 trucks are delicately soft. And then you might have a real hard European with, that has a lot of high solids in it and it's very dense. And we, you know, I just teach basically the sections and, and in some cars and some Teslas, you have hard and soft surfaces from fender to door, from fender to door, because they're, they're the same paint coat, but they're, they're built on different plants with different types of solids, densities. It looks the same, but it's totally different. That's why when you start running across, you do a training session, you think, man, I'm going to use this, this pad, this pad, and this pad. And then you go do another one, a BMW that's got ceramic clear on it. You're like, man, what that guy taught me didn't doesn't work. 
because it's a lot harder surface. So, you know, so you find your tendencies, but you have to do your section passes and see how the paint's cutting per panel in a lot of cases. Yep. Yeah, there's some Hondas that have an aluminum hood. Some some early 2000 Hondas have an aluminum hood and the rest of the body's steel. Same paint code, same paint, but it's totally a different reaction when you hit aluminum because the way the heat dissipation goes out so much more than it does on a steel uh, panel. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's what everybody wants to know is, uh, you know, and that's my job is to teach them from a paint background a little bit about what I'm, look, I'm looking at when I'm looking at a paint. And I can see if there's a check, if it's a check problem, as you know, Rob, it's a primer, the primer's drying out and the paint's collapsing on top of it. So, and, the, and the, you'll see a lot of these high solids are coming out with these high solids. Instead of putting two coats of paint on, three coats of paint on, they decided to thicken it up a little bit and put two coats in. You see what happens in it, it, it volcanoes and that solvent can't get out. So it's, if you look at it, it's like a little uh, volcano busting through that coat, trying to let that solvent escape out of that paint is trapped. So absolutely. So, so as you're talking to the different people that, that you've trained, because obviously right now you're not in training mode, um, what are some creative things that you're seeing that um, detail business owners are doing to keep either their business moving or to elevate their game? You know, I, I, I think we can learn so much from this. We went and got uh, Chick-fil-A's the other day, and I was thinking about evolving, how we're going to evolve. And when I got to the Chick-fil-A, the line was way back to the road. And I'm like, man, I don't want to wait that long. But we didn't have nothing to do. We were trying to get out of the house. <laughs> so we knew they were open. But what I was impressed with, I was really impressed with seeing these guys. Some of the other businesses were closed that were fast food. And these guys were hammered. And they had processors out there with tablets, you know, and programs like what you guys sell. And they were coming up. Can I get your name? My name is Bob. And they were coming to us which was amazing. They took all their inner staff and moved them out to the drive-thru and, and made that, and, and they evolved so neat. So when I think at the detailers, I'm thinking, what can we do? What can these detailers do to survive? I, I think there's a lot of big things they can do. Uh, bring on, bring on a, a, a van, uh, bring up, put a power wash in it and a tank. And if things get bad, you can go out and power wash decks. You can do power wash buildings and acid clean them and power wash them. And you can do mobile service with that. And when the pandemic, when the pandemic's gone, you have, you have another sideline to your business that you branched. I believe that this pandemic threw us a lemon and we need to turn it into a lemonade. And that's, if we got to keep our minds sharp, you know, get up, get cleaned up, get studying, study your business, look for avenues how to evolve so you can be, we can come out of this bigger and better when it's all said and done. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. That, I think that's probably the best attitude that anybody can have is, is to, you know, learn from it like anything, like any big thing that comes in, you know, you learn from it. Um, uh, any, anything that sucks really bad. I, I, am, I am horrible at this. I, I literally I have three sets of glasses. It bothers me so bad that my eyes are giving out in my old age. <clears throat> but I have to learn from that and I have to learn how to evolve from that. Yeah. I mean, I have to take that that permanent thing that's not going to change and figure out what I can do to move that forward. So I have all kinds of strategies that I've done. And my kids were laughing at me the other day because I had two pairs of these glasses stacked on top of each other. And they're like, are you really wearing two pairs of glasses? I said, yes, but I've learned if I put these two pairs on, I have a large set of reading glasses instead of bifocals on the bottom. So you just got to learn and you got to move on. I mean, you know, <laughs> Some of the stuff you in your old age, like for instance, I don't have to buy shampoo. It's a useless product for me. So you know. <laughs> no, you just had to buy polishing pads. That's right. And cream. <laughs> sometimes you burn through, you know, you gotta, you gotta be careful there. <laughs> yeah, your, your wife has learned how to use a polisher the last two years. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, but my kids have, I actually have a video of my, one of my daughters, like we call her my princess because she's, the girliest girl that we have. We have three daughters. And um, one day she had to, she didn't want to help out in the house. And so my wife said, fine, go help your dad. And so she changed the oil on a three quarter ton truck and she restored the headlights. And 
I've got videos of her with the pad. She didn't complain once. She did the whole thing, sanded it down with, you know, multi-grit, one, one, three steps of sandpaper, two steps of pads. I mean, she did the whole thing and the whole process and she, you know, she learned something from it. So awesome. That's awesome. That's great, man. So look at, looking ahead, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's a lot of things, a lot of pressure to get things moving and in, in our country. Um, but I mean, you know, what, what are the things that you're planning on doing as things start to open up to really elevate mm -hmm. your game as a trainer and bring, you know, that to your clients? I think, um, I think everybody's, you know, at the new shows, they're going to be, it's all going to be about interior protection with sanitizers and disinfectants. And I think, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm studying everything and understanding surfaces a little bit more than what we used to. And you know, if you're doing a uncoated leather <clears> and you put a high alkaline disinfectant on it, it uh, versus a coated leather. And how you can tell the difference is put a drop of uh, distilled water in a, in a spot that under the seat. And if it sucks into that, you're dealing with a surface that's gonna absorb that cleaner and you could have a tendency to fade it or even stain it with the dwell times that they might be requiring. So I'm learning what are all the surfaces that I'm gonna be cleaning with this higher dwell time. And I think that's gonna be really important and really beef up the interior. And I think we're gonna be as an industry stronger because we've always put our attention on correcting paint and doing the cool things, painting cars and stuff. And now it's gonna be like the cool thing is getting the crud out of these cars and getting them clean properly without damaging these cars. And then giving that customer a peace of mind knowing they can get into that car and it's relatively clean. We can't make any claims. We're not going to do that, but right. we're going to do our best. And they, they're going to expect that detailer to do his best too. So, yep. yep. Yeah. And that's, it's funny. Cause I, I, I remembered this, we've got several of these laying around, but I pulled this out the other day and put it up there. And I think that's really, this is more prevalent than ever is the detailing industry needs to get stronger. Um, I've, I've actually been a little disappointed at seeing how much bashing has been going on during this. This is a time when everybody needs to come together. And I mean, if <clears throat> if Jody and I were in the same town and we were, you know, let's say I'm mobile and he's got a shop, we should be partnering up. I should be saying, hey, I've got a coating. I can't do it. I'm mobile. Can I borrow your shop? I'll give you a percentage of it. And we should be, <clears throat> you know, coming together. I know two guys in in Utah that do that. They, they borrow, one guy borrows the other guy's shop. They do work together. There's several of them that are partnering up. And that's how you, that's how we elevate this whole industry and make everybody realize that the industry is a, is a very, very, to steal a term that we've heard a lot of, a very essential industry in making things better. I mean, somebody that's taking a car that doesn't know what they're doing, they don't know how to get that stuff out of there. You know, they don't, they have no idea how to get bugs off the front, crud out of the seats, you know, uh, some of the horror stories here about dogs inside of cars having problems or kids having problems, or you see those cars with trash up to the windows. You got to yeah. put that stuff out of there. And I think that's going to be the big push is, like you said, absolutely, Bob, is let's get these interiors clean. Let's get them as, as sanitized as humanly possible. Um, and I think that is very important. I, I have a very unique background. I also not only have a certification in detailing, but I have a certification in residential building inspections and I used to own a, own a home inspection company. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> there's a thing you do when you're in home inspections. You do not say it's mold free unless you have a certification in mold remover. You mm -hmm. can't even say that it's mold. You legally yeah. cannot say that. You can say it is a mold like substance and that that mold like substance has been removed to the best of my ability. That's yes. as far as you can go. And I think that's what detailers have to keep that in mind too. You can't say, oh, I can 100% sanitize your vehicle and, and say that it is virus free. No, you cannot. Not unless you have some kind of a certification that, that and the tools and the equipment to make that claim. So. Absolutely. And I, I've sat back and said very little through this whole thing with social media. You know, our company takes a stand of let, let's let the professionals and the experts figure out the enemy first and then we'll come in with the game plan after we talk to the CDC right. and, and what we're going to do to attack this enemy. And we've seen detailers all over doing different things and claiming they could do this and that. And uh, they eat a little crow a little bit because of it too. So, uh, so yeah, I think better to sit back uh, and at the same time study and learn 
uh, listen to things like we're doing right now is get, get people's confidence up, build them up, lift them up, and, and get more educated. Uh, and work and work or keep working our way towards maybe that certification in, in, in a contaminant certification. And then that, that takes time, a uh, five week course or something, and it takes money. So a lot of detailers are going to come out of this with not very much time or money. So, but they need to work towards that uh, being essential and, and going to those local agencies and saying, hey guys, I need to be on the same page as you. What do I have to do to be essential? I mean, you might have to start repairing little motors and stuff just to have that on as, as a part of what you can do to keep open with the next pandemic. So really look at what, the, what you can do to keep your business open and keep yourself essential. Yep, yep. It's my, my standard thing is when I was a mechanic, um, everybody wanted to do just like in just like in paint correction. Everybody wanted to do the cool stuff. Everybody wanted to work on a Ferrari or Corvette. And I used to say, brakes on a Honda is what pays the bills. So you've yeah. got to look at some things that may not be as cool, but that's what that's what you do in business. Mm-hmm. So so what are and and kind of wrap up here? What are one or two key things that I mean? We've had some great suggestions already for business owners, but what are a couple of key things that you think will really help them move into, you know, being able to be in full production mode and really grow their business? You know, I, I, I always liked the mobile unit, but when people called me, they were asking me what to do and I was reluctant because our stand is to be, you know, we're a huge company. We don't want lawsuits or anything like that. So sure. we didn't want to do anything. So, you know, I told them that you got somebody with a motor home, or a boat, or a camper that's in a barn, uh, make a quote on it, go out there and try to uh, give them a price on a ceramic coating. Ceramic coatings, we've got good profit to build into those. They can keep you running, keep your cash flow going. Uh, that, that was just one of the suggestions, and a lot of them were, were thinking about that and saying, yeah, that's a good idea. But, you know, just gift cards, you know, offer gift cards at a discount right now, so when the doors open up, you've got some cash flow coming in, or you've got cash flow coming in now. So, Yep. And I, I like your suggestion earlier of taking the things that you already have, like a pressure washer and looking at other ways you can use that. So you might not want to be the guy that pressure washes decks, but there's a whole lot of people that want their decks pressure washed in the springtime. Um, yes. Look at your environment and see what is needed in your area. We know one guy that owns a big uh, brick and mortar shop, but he also stores motorcycles and that's kept his cash flow going through the winter and into the spring right now is because he's got a storage facility as well. So try to branch out and look at other ways that you can, you know, keep the cash flow coming. That's a good idea, Rob, because you know, right now you're looking at spring, people are wanting to get their boats in the water. They got crud from last year. You could go out there and blast it off, make, make a few hundred bucks and keep your family fed. So absolutely do whatever you have to do to keep the cash flow going and keeping your, your doors open is, is awesome. Yeah. Well, Bob, thank you so much for taking some time with us. It was fun to watch you uh, putting your son to work. And uh, <laughs> But how, how do people reach out to you? How do they get involved with uh, being trained by you? And, you know, what? how do they connect? Well, you get you can get a hold of me at robertrossman at gmail.com. Or you can, uh, Bob Rossman on Facebook or Bob Rossman on LinkedIn um, or Instagram. So, but I'm an old guy, so I'm not real good at that stuff, but my kids help me get that stuff going. <laughs> you know what? You, you got to know your skills and leverage those that have the skills to help you where you're weak. So it's good. Yeah. It's just Absolutely. like Rod, Rod counts the beans and squeaks and I talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, no, do, you, guys, you guys, thanks for having me on. It's Absolutely. fun. Uh, it's, you guys do a great job and I love your content and love the people that you put on there. It's awesome. Oh, thanks. Yeah. We, we have a really good time doing it. It And really, you know, the story is about you. It's about Bob Rassman. It's about, you know, everybody else that we've had on here, Joab Flores. And, you know, I could just, there's like 75 different people. So there's no way I could list them all, but it's super fun because everybody's background story is so unique, but there are so many parallels and overlapping that enable all of us to learn and to grow and to to bring all of our businesses up and that's really the goal is to help all of us become better business owners and yes. you know highlight what you're doing in your market so thank you so much for what you're doing 
and training and helping people. And we want to thank everybody that tunes into us. Make sure that you check out our podcast and also go out to the YouTube channel and make sure that you subscribe. All of those videos are uploaded. So thank you so much. And we will check you guys same time, same bat channel just next Thursday. Thanks, you guys. Thanks. Thanks. You guys have a great day. See ya. See ya. Ha, 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 ha.